Okay, hi everyone. Whoa, I suppose I should turn this up. Let me try that again. Hi everyone. Um, nice to see you all here. We're rapidly nearing the end of the term, which is I'm sure good news to everyone. Uh, we only have two more full courses left, classes left in this course. Uh, today, which is Wednesday uh, and Monday. Uh, then we'll have time for review on Wednesday and maybe just anything that didn't uh, fit into Monday's lecture, but we're almost finished, which is fantastic. Uh, we've covered almost the entire course, uh, most of the textbook, all of the material that I wanted to cover. So we're going to try to fit a few things in uh, today. Um, I've got some stuff at the beginning that is a little bit of holdover or leftover from stuff that I couldn't quite get to at the end of Monday's class. Now, you may be asking yourself, why can't you ever finish things <laughs> on time? That's a great question. Um, I should know how to finish things on time. Uh, and you may even be saying, you know, you, you've been teaching this course for 20 years, Professor Minda. How come you don't know what exactly will fit into a lecture? Well, I don't actually know exactly what will fit into a lecture. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think we're going to get everything in today, though. I know I always say that at the beginning, uh, and then it's always sort of a crap shoot as to whether or not things are actually going to work out. Uh, let's go to the first uh, first of two announcements I want to make. First of all, let's hide this floating meeting control. There we go. Remember to do course evaluations. I checked the course evaluation response rate. Obviously, I can't see your actual responses until well into the next term, towards the end of the next term, but I can see how many people have responded. 7.91% of you have completed. Uh, that's not great, um, but it's good that some of you have completed. Uh, so 91.37% of you have not yet begun, uh, and a very small sliver of you have started the course evaluations but not completed. So whenever you have some time, uh, in fact, you could do it now if you want to, uh, when I'm sort of going off on a tangent and not really explaining anything interesting, uh, go ahead and uh, log on to the course evaluation site and complete them just to get them out of way. This is not live, by the way. So if you do complete them, this won't go up. Uh, it'll just be nice to know that you've had a chance to do them. So yes, by all means, if you've got a device with you now, go ahead and take five minutes to complete the course evaluation. Maybe something will be fresh in your mind, like Professor Minda can't finish the lecture on time all the time. And so we have to keep going on to the next uh, term. Uh, anyway, I'll remind everyone today, I'm reminding you today, I'll remind you on Monday, and I'll probably remind you again on Wednesday, uh, and then probably again via email before the end of the uh, end of the term, which is uh, exactly next week. How many of you feel enthusiastic about the end of the term, uh, but not so enthusiastic about the beginning of finals uh, coming up? It's understandable. I feel exactly the same way. I feel your pain, as they say. All right, so we're going to just go back a few slides. Um, I actually covered some of this in lecture on Wednesday, or Monday rather, but you know how it is. Whenever I want to go back a little bit, I always feel like it's too abrupt to just start exactly at the slide that I left off. So I like to go back just a few. We'll go through these really quickly. Uh, this is where we kind of, about five minutes before we ended uh, the lecture on Monday, we talked about convergent thinking. That's a measure of creativity or an aspect of creativity or some uh, characteristic of the nature of creativity in which disparate things can be brought together. So a creative person or someone who is thinking creatively is someone who can see the things that bring uh, what looks like they aren't connected, see the ways in which they are connected. In other words, seeing the connections between things. Uh, one of the ways this can be assessed is with something known as the remote associates task. And we talked about how the remote associates task works. Uh, and that's where you find the one word that is common uh, to all, uh, all three of these uh, individual words. We talked about how this can be used experimentally. Uh, we just discover, discovered uh, some research that talked about positive affect or positive mood. So you put your participants in a positive mood. Uh, you can do positive mood induction in a number of ways. Uh, the first way they did positive mood induction in this study was to uh, show participants a video that sort of had some jokes in it, right? So something that was kind of funny or put people in a lighthearted mood. And then they asked them to uh, do a task of problem solving. In this case, it was that candle box task that we talked about uh, earlier in the lecture. Uh, the second way in which they made uh, people uh, change people's mood 
uh, was to give them a small bag of candy uh, before they started the study. And then they asked them to do a remote associates task. Uh, so when participants were shown the video and then asked to do the candle box functional, uh, candle box functional fixedness uh, task, uh, they found that people who saw the positive film uh, were more likely to complete it than people who saw the, neutr the neutral film. The facilitative display was a video that showed people how to solve the problem, uh, gave them some extra hints. So that was another way to sort of uh, increase people's ability to solve this problem. So being in a positive mood seems to just, uh, allow you to think a little bit more creatively, maybe release some of the functional fixedness, uh, and also to see something that might be pulling some disparate aspects together. When they put them in a happy mood by giving them 10 pieces of wrapped hard candy and a glad fun time sandwich bag before they actually did the study, they found that for these moderate difficulty items, uh, candy participants completed more items. Uh, so it was easier for you to do some of these remote associates tasks. You did a little bit better uh, in doing remote associate tasks when you're in a positive uh, mood. Uh, we then talked about divergent thinking, which is, as it suggests, rather than thinking about how many things can be similar, it's how you can take one thing and go off in many different directions. Uh, so it's uh, a different way of thinking about uh, creativity, the ability to move one's thoughts in novel, unanticipated directions. And this can also be measured and assessed. In this case, divergent thinking can be measured and assessed uh, with something called the unusual uses task. Uh, and that's where participants are given some simple object. In this case, this is an example, but there are lots of other uh, simple objects. You might be given a simple object like a brick and asked to list how many possible uses you can come up with. Uh, this sounds like a measure of creativity. It also sounds like kind of a fun way to pass the time if you have no other particular kind of game to play and you're on a long trip or a long drive. Like how many different things can you think to do with a brick, right? Uh, and the way in which this is a measure of divergent thinking is to score the number of things that a participant says and the statistical rarity of those things. Common things like a paperweight or a doorstop, uh, that's not very statistically rare. That's the first thing that comes to most people's minds. So it's, it's worth noting, but it's not particularly creative. Um, a stepladder, if you want to grab something just out of reach or a means of writing messages on a sidewalk, that might be a little bit less uh, statistically uh, common to produce. Maybe people don't produce that as often. So that might be scored as a little bit more rare and therefore higher uh, measure of divergent thinking. Um, and you might ask other things like choosing five names, how many different ways can these names be classified? So you can see what both of these tasks have in common uh, is that they ask people to go from a starting point and they go out into as many possible directions. And we can also measure people's creativity this way. That was the second aspect of creativity that we talked about at the end of Monday's class. And then finally, we talked about something called forward flow. Uh, unlike a state of flow, which is in a psychological state when you uh, seem to be less aware of how long you've been working on something and you feel really satisfied to can keep working on it, forward flow is how much one's current thinking breaks away from past thoughts. In other words, your ability to let go of functional fixedness or your ability uh, to think about things in different ways or to think outside the box. All of these things, divergent thinking, convergent thinking, and forward flow seem to be distinct. They can be measured with different tasks. Those tasks do correlate, but they don't correlate perfectly. Uh, and so likely there are different ways to be creative uh, and creativity itself is probably some combination of these factors. Okay, so this is exactly where we left off on Monday. So there are stages of creativity. Not every creative act or every insight problem solving or every insight that you might have is gonna follow these stages. Uh, but this is a rough approximation of the way your thinking process might occur. There is some neuropsychological evidence uh, for things like the moment of illumination or insight. Uh, and there's also some psychological and neuropsychological evidence for the idea of incubation. In other words, the idea that you might not be actively trying to solve a problem or actively trying to reach insight, but there's some spreading activation that allows it to occur even when you're not actively trying to solve something. So let's talk about these uh, four steps, the preparation 
phase, which might be described as the information gathering phase. So whether it's problem solving, creativity, uh, or any other kind of aspect or measure or task or behavior that requires you to do something novel, you gotta get your, get your, get your things together, right? Uh, you have to think about the problem that needs to be solved, uh, think about the goal that you need to attain, think about the means that you have at your disposal, think about the givens uh, that are there in front of you. All of these things are um, aspects of information gathering uh, and preparation. In many cases, especially for creativity and insight problem solving, and insight problem solving is the kind of problem solving where it doesn't seem very obvious how you're going to solve the problem, but a solution seems to arise without you necessarily working on it all the time. How many of you have had an experience where uh, you arrive at the solution of a problem or a game or a puzzle, and it feels really satisfying to get there? Uh, and that maybe you didn't even think about it. So I mentioned on Monday, of course, I like to play any of those New York Times word games every single day, whether it's Connections or Wordle or any one of a number of small crossword puzzles. Uh, it's a satisfying thing to do either in the morning or in the evening, right? Just takes a few minutes. Uh, and sometimes you feel really satisfied. Sometimes you start the puzzle in the beginning of the day and then you're like, I cannot get this. There's no way I can get this Wordle. And then you just leave it aside. Then you come back and you think, oh, well, it's really obvious exactly what the answer is. And you solve it really quickly. What's likely happening in that case is you're taking a conscious break and you're allowing some incubation to happen. You're not thinking about it. You're not working on it. But spreading activation might still be happening. Furthermore, some of the solution paths, which are false starts or not correct paths, can be abandoned. Uh, you can come back and look at the problem with fresh eyes. I'll talk a little bit more in the next few slides about an experiment that shows how that works. Uh, in creative thinking or insight problem solving, there's usually some moment at which an insight arrives, either suddenly or over a period of maybe a few minutes or a few seconds or something like that, uh, where you start to feel as if you are close to a solution. You can almost feel yourself getting there. You don't have the solution yet, but you feel like you're going to solve it in just a few minutes. Then it arrives, and many people, in this case, uh, might uh, express some feeling of relief, like, ah, that's really obvious. That there was a trick question, but that's what it means. You know, that's how you solve the problem. Of course, it's really obvious now. Uh, and then you feel kind of relieved and feel really satisfied that you were able to solve. Uh, finally, there's some verification stage. You want to know that this uh, insight or this creative insight leads to an appropriate solution. So let's talk about some of these in just a little bit more detail. I want to talk about the incubation and uh, illumination phase in a little bit more detail. Uh, so incubation, this is this idea that uh, a solution pops into your head uh, after you've stopped working on it. Um, many times, uh, certainly this happens in uh, games and puzzles, but it also happens in your own work. Uh, I don't know from your perspective, but uh, if I'm working on a computer programming problem or a coding problem, uh, if it's a particularly challenging coding problem, I might give up for a while and say, I don't have time to deal with this. I'm just not going to work on it right now. And then I might come back to it a day later or two days later, uh, and it's a lot easier to solve. Uh, what's happening or what seems to happen is you're released from some kind of proactive interference. Uh, you're released from competition from some of the false uh, solution paths. And probably uh, some kind of spreading activation continues to occur uh, even when you're not thinking about it. Another example is what's known as this tip of the tongue phenomenon where uh, you're asked to remember something. Uh, and you can't quite remember the answer, but you can almost feel yourself being able to say the right answer. Uh, so it's on the tip of your tongue, as they say. For a lot of tip of the tongue phenomenon, uh, it's not uncommon for people to suddenly get the answer after they've stopped thinking about it. So 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, a day later, when it's no longer useful, <laughs> or maybe not very impressive that you've remembered this obscure fact, it suddenly pops into your head and you're like, ah, yes, that's the answer. Uh, so that suggests that there's some spreading activation uh, happening. It might occur during some kind of mind wandering, allowing your mind to wander uh, and therefore maybe explore some solution paths that weren't uh, relevant. 
spreading activation in semantic memory, in your semantic memory network might still occur. We already have discussed spreading activation is something that you don't always have conscious awareness of. Uh, spreading activation is something that seems to happen automatically. When a concept is activated, the activation spreads to other related concepts. We talked about that within memory models and also, also within the idea of a fan effect. Related ideas can come to mind through memory connections. Uh, a third possibility or mechanism for how incubation works uh, is that you might just get frustrated uh, trying to solve something. You're working on the wrong solution. Uh, and so some of that, uh, whether it's working on the wrong solution or just the frustration of not being able to solve it, allows you to solve it a little bit more easily uh, with a bit of a break. Here's an example of an experiment that introduced a break artificially uh, when people were trying to solve insight problems. So these are examples of insight problems. They get easier once you solve the first one. Uh, what's the expression for the first one that comes to mind? So what's the uh, idiom? Uh, so you would interpret this as reading between the lines, right? It's not very funny, uh, but that's what it is. And this would be a split second timing. Uh, these are sort of, I don't think they're that funny. Um, but the, you can see how the more that you solve them, the easier they get to solve. Uh, this one is, what's the expression here? Search high and low, because there's search high and there's and low. This one is a hole in one. There's the one, there's hole in the middle of it. This is obviously jack in the box. And this is... Somebody have the answer for the last one? Double or nothing. There's double or there's nothing. Uh, so these are all ways to dis to show these. Now, how many of you, did I have the answers in the notes? Because sometimes I put the answers in the notes or on the next page. Are the answers in the notes for that? How many of you solved some of these without looking at the answers that were in the notes? How many of you didn't solve them, but as they were being solved, felt kind of re relieved to hear the solution? Like a little bit of like, ah, yes, obvious. Right? So that's an example of the illumination insight, that aha moment that you get when you solve a problem. So let's come back to how incubation works. Uh, in an experimental setting, you can present participants with a large number of these. Uh, some of them they will solve, some of them they will not. Uh, but suppose you give everybody 30 seconds to work through these uh, and solve as many as you can, uh, and then uh, you interrupt a group. So control participants had a minute to work on each puzzle. Other participants worked on each puzzle for 30 seconds and then were interrupted. So you can have a group that gets a minute to solve as many as they want. And then you get a, minute, a group that gets half a minute and then you say, okay, let's do something else for a little while. Uh, and you give them some additional instructions. And then you say, okay, now let's go back to trying to solve some of those. Everybody gets exactly 60 seconds to try to solve these. Um, the other gets an interruption an interruption where they have to do something else that requires their working memory uh, and language ability. So they're not working on these. They have to do something else. It's not an unfilled break. So everybody has uh, 60 seconds to try to solve these. One group has an interruption. Uh, now you might think that being interrupted would make it harder to solve the problems. The interruption actually improved performance. Uh, the solution was more likely uh, from this incubation group. The idea was that it might be possible that the solutions were still being worked on, that there was still some spreading activation, even while you were doing something else. The other thing that you might be doing wouldn't necessarily compete uh, with some of these solutions. Um, however, and this is a stronger evidence, the incubation participants, in other words, the people that were interrupted, uh, didn't remember some of the other information. So in some cases, uh, they were given clues that were wrong clues. Uh, so information that might distract you from being able to solve the problem. Uh, the incubation participants, the participants that were interrupted were less likely to remember that, suggesting that not only did they benefit from the break, but one of the ways in which they benefited from the break was to forget the information that was putting them in the wrong space, forget the information uh, that was a bit of a distraction. So it allowed them to come up with a solution more readily uh, and more easily. So sometimes taking a break from solving a problem can allow you to have some insights. I'm sure some of you use that technique even when you're taking an exam. 
right? Maybe you go through and answer the exam questions that you can uh, quickly, take a little bit of a break and then go back uh, and re-examine each one of those. Maybe uh, you realize that some of those were the wrong answer. I think occasionally we might talk ourselves into, talk ourselves out of the right answer <laughs> and into a wrong answer, which if that is something that happens to you sometimes, I would suggest a third phase, uh, which is the phase where you answer them then you talk yourself out of whether or not you thought the answer that first came to mind was the right answer. And then you go back and reevaluate your reevaluation uh, so that you're, you've got three times to go through uh, to see if that illumination uh, still happens. Uh, so forgetting these false uh, negatives or false positives, forgetting these distractor items seems to be what causes this uh, incubation advantage. This other phase, the, the idea that you have this sort of positive feeling, this positive vibe when you get uh, the right answer, uh, or this sort of feeling of relief when you see what the obvious answer is for double or nothing or whole in one or any of those kinds of things, can be uh, considered an illumination phase where creative discoveries don't include these steps. Uh, they might happen in a back and forth. This aha moment signals a new approach uh, not necessarily that the approach is going to lead uh, to a new solution, uh, but that you've tried something new. So you get sort of closer. You don't always get the right answer, but you get closer to getting that right answer. And you start to feel uh, some sense of uh, relief. This can be measured by in two ways. First, by asking people how likely they are to solve the problem. Uh, in this case, participants were asked to sort of rate on a one to 10 scale how warm they felt. Like you're getting hotter at being able to solve this. The warmer you get, the more likely you are to solve that problem. Like the kind of game you might play when you're a young kid and something is hidden and then somebody says, am I getting warmer? You're getting warmer and you get closer to the object. You get the idea, right? So we give people uh, an insight problem, a problem that requires some kind of novel solution or some kind of insight. So look at problem number one. A stranger approached a museum curator and offered him an ancient bronze coin. The coin had an authentic appearance and was marked with the date 554 BC. The curator had happily made acquisitions from suspicious sources before, but this time he promptly called the police and had the stranger arrested. Why? Uh, so why does the curator know that something is going to be... It wouldn't stamp BC uh, in 554 uh, BC, right? 554 BC is a time stamp that we can give uh, based on other historical events. But at that time, BC wouldn't have meant anything. Um, a landscape gardener is given instructions to plant four special trees so that each one is exactly the same distance from one of the others. So this is kind of a version of the nine dot problem, isn't it? Now you got four trees. And each tree has to be exactly the same distance from the others. How should the trees be arranged? Correct solution in this case is to put them in a pyramid shape, right? So that one is on a mound and it's exactly the same distance from the others on the ground, which are the same distance uh, from, the, from the others on the ground. So you've got uh, a triangle on the ground and something on the top. That way each point can be equidistant from ev every other point. These aren't difficult to solve. Uh, people can solve them if given enough time. Uh, but usually it requires some kind of insight, uh, some kind of way to think about what is maybe the trick in this case. In this case, the trick is, oh, right, obviously, 554 BC makes no sense on a coin. Uh, and the trick here is, all right, well, maybe you wouldn't think to plant things on with a, one tree on top of a, of a mound or a pyramid like that, but that's the way to solve this particular problem. What participants found was that uh, at the time of solution, obviously, they rated themselves as a 10 because they've solved it, right? So they feel really warm because uh, they just had the solution. But most people, before they get to the solution, can start to accurately rate themselves as getting closer. So maybe it's not an immediate illumination, but it is a sense, there's a metacognitive sense that you're getting closer to the solution even before you get to the solution. So 10 seconds before the solution, there's a significant increase in people's self-monitoring or self-rated uh, assessments of how warm they are, how close they are to being able to solve it. They haven't solved it yet, but they're aware that they're getting close and they're 
measures, their self-report measures, seem to accurately uh, depict that. Finally, this can be measured uh, in, uh, with an EEG as well. Uh, so you can track electrical activity in the brain, uh, in this case, uh, uh, tracking uh, gamma power uh, in this parietal uh, area. At the time that solution uh, is arrived, there should be a difference between solving uh, the problem with insight and not solving the problem with insight. Insight problem solutions uh, uh, show this uh, spike, uh, this negative spike in voltage, whereas non-insight solutions don't show this negative uh, spike uh, in uh, voltage. So there's a measurable difference in the brain right around the time the solution is arrived at. Uh, other research, which I didn't include here, shows that people, when you track people's eye movements uh, in a visual spatial problem that requires an insight, people will spend more time looking around the area where the solution is before they arrive at the solution. So they haven't solved it yet, but they start looking at the area where the information that's relevant to the solution. So there's a suggestion that the brain is working in an area that's going to provide the solution. We can detect this and rate it. Uh, we can measure this uh, at the brain level. Does that seem clear to everyone? So the illumination phase seems to be a real thing. There's neuropsychological evidence and cognitive evidence uh, for it. So problem solving, which is what we talked about on Monday uh, and didn't finish, <laughs> is a complex skill uh, involving representation uh, and thinking. And good problem solving depends on specifying the components, finding the operators, uh, finding the solution by memory. Uh, we can do this with an algorithm, we can do this with heuristics. We can do this uh, with creativity and insight. And if we do it a lot, we become experts. And one way to, which is the topic for today's uh, lecture, expertise and intelligence. So one way to describe people who are exceptional problem solvers is to describe them as experts. Uh, so we suggested that in problem solving, people who solve lots of similar problems get really good at solving those problems. If you were in the lecture on Monday, uh, we talked about people who put together IKEA furniture for a living get really good at. So the short video that we showed uh, depicted a woman who was a professional freelance flat pack furniture putter together. Uh, and you would call her and say, I have some chairs. Will you come over and put together the chairs? Uh, and her technique for putting things together was much more streamlined relative to the person who was solving the problem for the first time. IKEA furniture isn't difficult, but uh, it is difficult enough that it takes most of us a little while if we're not doing it often. Just like anything else, the more you do it, the better you get at doing it. And that's called expertise. Expertise develops. Real expertise. So I don't mean just familiarity with flat pack furniture or getting better at taking multiple choice exams, but let's say that you are an expert, someone who is described by others as an expert, you're known for what you do. Uh, that's what we would define as an expert, not just a good problem solver, but an expert problem solver. And Anders Ericsson, uh, who has been studying expertise uh, for decades, suggests three things define experts and differentiate them from non-experts. Real expertise has to pass three tests. First, it's got to lead to performance that is consistently superior. So not just sometimes better, but consistently superior to that of the expert's peers. Uh, so in whatever group that you might assess yourself relative to, the expert is gonna be consistently superior. Now, I might be considered an expert at some aspects of cognitive psychology, but relative to my peers in that field, I might not be consistently superior. I might just be in the middle of the pack, right? So expertise, of course, is relative to one's professional or artistic or otherwise uh, defined peer group. Uh, so maybe I know more about cognitive psychology uh, than undergraduate or graduate students in that field, uh, but I don't know more to other cognitive psychologists. There are lots of people who are much better uh, at doing the same kinds of things, who might be better experts. Second, real expertise produces concrete results. Uh, if you're a surgeon, uh, the outcomes have to be measured. Uh, if you're an investment banker, uh, the outcomes need to be measured. Uh, if you're an engineer, 
outcomes need to be measured. If you're a painter, your outcomes would be measured uh, in terms of producing things, but producing things that other people regard as good, right? Whether it is uh, you know, paintings that sell for more, paintings that are exhibited, uh, bridge designs that don't fail, uh, people who survive your surgery. A chess player must be able to win matches and tournaments. Uh, brain uh, surgeons, for example, not only skillful on their scalpels, but must have successful outcomes with their patients. Finally, true expertise can be replicated and measured in the lab. So you should be able to ask someone who is an expert to demonstrate their expertise, and you should be able to measure that. Uh, so expertise is consistently superior, concrete results, and you can replicate it and measure it in a laboratory setting. Um, another way to define experts, uh, and the way we, I've been defining it in this class uh, as well, this is not a, a, an alternative definition, but it's another uh, way to define it, uh, is someone who knows how to solve new problems, has a really good skill set for solving new problems, uh, and finds operators uh, that apply to these new problems. In particular, expert knows the answer. An expert would know the answer to familiar problems within medical expertise. For example, expert diagnosticians or uh, expert physicians, uh, expert specialists are those who have seen lots of patients. And so diagnosis is much easier and faster and more efficient because they know what to look for. Uh, if they're reading the results of a test, it's something that they're really familiar with. Uh, and so they can not be led astray by some of the uh, you know, some of the distractors, and they can make the diagnosis really easily because they have lots of prior experience. Uh, if you're putting together IKEA furniture, uh, you have lots of experience putting together IKEA furniture. Uh, you don't need to start from the beginning. That's what we saw with the video of the woman who was the professional flat pack furniture freelance putter together. Uh, Erickson also suggests that it takes time. Expertise is not something that you just get by being good at something initially. Uh, that might, that's called being good at something initially. Uh, that might be called having some uh, particular skill set uh, that enables you to do well at something or a personality type that enables you to focus uh, or work on something. But expertise itself does take time. Uh, Erickson suggests it takes most people about 10,000 hours or about 10 years to develop what is called expertise. So relative to their peers, uh, after doing something consistently for 10 years, trying to get better at it, the experts get better at it. Um, sometimes this is misinterpreted as being a rule, a 10,000 hour rule, uh, suggesting that if you just spend 10,000 hours doing something, uh, you become an expert. Uh, Erickson would suggest that's not entirely accurate. It's not sufficient. You've got to spend that time uh, dedicated to trying to be better. So it isn't just 10,000 hours doing something. It's 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to make yourself get better. So Erickson, in, which I'll show you on the next slide, uh, studied musicians in particular, uh, lots of other domains, but one study looked at musicians uh, and found that those uh, who are likely to have spent close to 20 hours or more a week uh, ended up being the most uh, expert, uh, ended up being the best and rated uh, as the best and most proficient uh, in their instrument. Uh, this idea of deliberate practice and the acquisition of expert performance. Remember, this is something that uh, talks about expert performance. Uh, there are lots of other kinds of expertise, but this is expert performance. You're an expert at doing something. Uh, suggests that most uh, experts uh, sort of go through three phases. You go through an introductory phase where you might uh, explore something uh, that you want to become an expert in. And most of you probably have had these kinds of experiences, right? Uh, in the time between your uh, when you're like maybe four and five and maybe uh, about 14 and 15, many of us have gone through you know, piano lessons, uh, hockey, uh, gymnastics, uh, soccer lesson, you know, uh, all sorts of sports activities uh, and so on, uh, maybe chess camp. It doesn't matter, right? There are probably lots of things that you had the opportunity to do uh, in your childhood that could have developed into something you're really good at. Uh, and most of us, by the way, probably didn't continue with them, right? Uh, maybe you played hockey 
competitively for a few years and then you're like, I just don't have time for this. And so you just stay at sort of that good level. Uh, or maybe uh, you uh, took uh, gymnastics uh, as a young kid and you got really good for a few years and then you're like, I don't have time for this. I don't have time to travel around to competitions. Uh, or maybe you took piano lessons. How many of you took piano lessons for a few years until you lost interest? Uh, you, maybe you passed grade eight conservatory exam and then you're like, you know what, that's fine. I'm just gonna stay at grade eight conservatory exam uh, and I'm not gonna study music at the university level, but I know how to play piano. Uh, that's not becoming an expert, that's just getting good at a skill. Expertise is where uh, you transition to full-time involvement. Somewhere in this phase two to phase three, the people who end up becoming experts decide, you know what, this is it, this is what I wanna do. I not only enjoy playing the piano, I plan to sp sp practice the piano 10, 15, 20 hours a week, uh, just trying to get better. And I plan to do that for my entire childhood uh, and into adolescence and into early adulthood because I wanna be a professional piano player. I actually wanna do this for a living. Those are the kind of people that Erickson studied. Uh, so in one uh, really well-known and highly cited study, they looked at professional uh, violinists uh, and violin students at the Music Academy of West Berlin. Uh, so these would be people who uh, are already good uh, violinists, but not only are they good violinists, they're good violinists at what I think we can all agree, even on the surface, sounds like a really good violin program, right? A violin program in Germany, uh, where people are selected based on their potential to be professional, internationally known soloists. So everybody in the school is already good, right? You wouldn't get into the school if you weren't already good. So now we're gonna take people who were in this school for good violinists and say, who is really good? Uh, so who is really an expert? These are good violinists, who are the best of the best? Um, and what they found uh, when through a series of diary studies uh, and an intervention and interview studies uh, is that the best students, those who were rated by their teachers as being the best uh, are ones who uh, estimated amounts of weekly practice uh, between 10, 15, and 25 hours. By the time some of the best violinists were 18 and 20, uh, they were practicing as much, almost as much as a full-time job. So they were spending the equivalent of a full-time job practicing their violin with the intention of getting better, not just playing it, but with the intention of getting better. This compares to uh, professional violinists at the international uh, level. So people who would be in internationally known orchestras playing violin. They too are the ones who would have been practicing 20, 25, and 30 hours by the time they were around 20. Uh, however, uh, good students, people who were listed as being okay, so they're really good, right? Because they're in this uh, prestigious music academy, but they're not the best students in the academy. They're just okay students uh, in the academy. They're already, these are the circle of students. These are were the ones who were eventually rated as good. Uh, even before they were rated as good, they were already practicing less, fewer hours per week than the ones who eventually get rated uh, as the best. This is when you're being rated here. Uh, uh, Pat, you know, once you're into this program, but by age 12 and 14, those who end up being rated as the best are already self-reporting that they've practiced more. The people who are good have self-reported they've practiced less. Uh, so this already seems to be a difference and it seems to depend on the ability to practice. And furthermore, this uh, category here, this is cumulative practice estimated. Uh, this is weekly practice estimated. Uh, these things are highly related because this is how much practice you put in across your entire career. Um, this group here of teachers, these are individuals at the academy who have selected uh, a teaching, a music education curriculum rather than a music performance curriculum. It's still a competitive program. Uh, it's still a program that requires a lot of work, but it's a program whose outcome is being a music teacher, not who's out being a violin teacher. Uh, not whose outcome is being a professional orchestra violinist. So you're doing other things. By definition, you're going to have less time to practice your instrument at getting better because you also have to learn how to instruct uh, in your own instrument and in other instruments and in music theory 
and everything else. Uh, and what they found is that uh, by age 20, the people who were music education specialists have only spent about 5,000 hours. They're about half as much practice as the people who are professionals and the best uh, at their uh, violin, who have spent 10,000 uh, hours relatively. So what Erickson is suggesting uh, is that once you've become an expert and you look back at your practice, it's likely that it took you about 10 years or about 10,000 hours of dedicated practice, deliberate practice, in order to attain that level of expertise. They've replicated this kind of work with uh, chess players, with uh, pianists, and even with expert uh, touch typists, people who can type really fast and accurately. Uh, it seems to be roughly the same. It's that 10,000 hours. Um, this is the uh, comparison uh, with pianists. Here are amateur pian piano players. Here are expert piano players showing the same uh, effect. Erickson was clear to point out, though, uh, that this is not sufficient. Uh, the number of hours uh, is not the cause of the expertise. It's the amount of time that you spend dedicated to improving your performance that seems to be a precursor for any expertise, but it's not the only cause. And as he suggests, it's the belief that a sufficient amount of expertise and practice uh, leads to maximal performance appears incorrect. So it's not sufficient. It's just one component of expertise. Um, I've just sort of pointed out a longer bit here. Uh, if you read some of the uh, work from about 10 years ago from Malcolm Gladwell, who is a uh, well-known popular science writer who suggested this idea of the 10,000 hour rule uh, is really based more on a misinterpretation uh, of Erickson's work. Uh, it's not a magic number uh, for true expertise. It's one of many uh, things that seems to predict uh, expertise, uh, but not necessarily some uh, causal uh, connection. As Erickson writes, it has to be deliberate practice. You gotta spend that time trying to get better. And sometimes you don't get better. Yes. Yeah. That's it, you know. Yeah. Yes. So that is a great question. If you didn't hear the question, the question is, is there like a critical period? You know how there's like a critical period in language, right? The suggestion that if you're not exposed to language at a certain time, you're not gonna be uh, able to pick it up in the right way. So the idea, is there a critical period for this kind of expertise? And the answer is it's not clear because of some of the other things that might be uh, some of the other contaminants for that kind of research. Uh, in order to accumulate 10 years, uh, of violin expertise, you will have to start somewhere, right? If you start when you are five, uh, you have a much better chance of getting those 10 years or 10,000 hours in before the time that you would need to choose a different professional career. Uh, and so that's one of the things that makes it difficult. How do you tease apart that kind of societal uh, critical period, the idea that you need time to be able to work for 10 years or 10,000 hours developing something uh, before you need to become independent uh, and working on something else. It's likely that someone could become a late in life expert deciding I would like to do X and I'm gonna spend the next 10 years uh, trying to get better at doing X. It's just a lot harder for someone in their 20s or 30s to stop doing something. Uh, and to dedicate the next 10 years to trying to pick up some new skill. Uh, and so it's really hard to measure those kinds of things. But that's a great question. Uh, it's likely a mix. It's likely that when people are younger, there's more uh, plasticity available. There's more neuroplasticity. Uh, there's fewer competition. Uh, there's a little bit less prefrontal cortex and executive control. And so there's a little bit more malleability uh, in terms of the new skills that you can pick up. But there are also not as many distractors. Uh, not as many other constraints. If you have the time and the means and the resources uh, to dedicate to getting better at something, uh, you can do it a little bit more easily uh, when you're young. I don't have time to go into it, um, but there's also competing research from athletics uh, and sports performance suggesting that uh, you often find a different kind of critical period or effect in athletics. Uh, the people who end up being really good professional athletes often didn't specialize in one sport uh, early on. Uh, specialized in lots of sports, or, or didn't specialize 
In other words, learn lots of different athletic uh, activities uh, and then uh, started to work on something later on. So early, uh, you know, some kind of early dedication to an athletic pursuit can lead to more injuries uh, and a little bit more burnout. Uh, rather than starting uh, working on soccer or hockey at age five, it might be better to try lots of sports uh, and then find out uh, that you're particularly good at one of them, at which you then uh, spend more time doing that a little bit later. So it takes you longer uh, to maybe dedicate that time. That's a great question. Any other questions before we move on from this uh, slide? Um, let's talk a little bit more about expertise effects, and then we'll move into intelligence. Uh, experts likely see different things about the world, um, and that's because they have more experience seeing the world in particular ways. Um, remember all the way back to like, I don't know, the third, fourth, fifth week of the class when we talked about concepts and categories, and we suggested that most of us name and recognize objects at the basic level. Right? So when faced with a bunch of different kinds of hammers, we don't say tool, we say hammer. When faced with a bunch of different kinds of birds, we don't name the individual species, or we don't say animal, we say bird. Um, there's a lot of research from bird experts, people who would be bird watchers, birders, people whose hobby it is or whose livelihood it is depends uh, on being able to identify birds. So people who have spent 10 years of their life being uh, really good bird watchers, trying to identify different species. Uh, operate at the subordinate level. In other words, they name objects instinctively. They name birds instinctively at the subordinate species level uh, rather than the uh, basic level. So close this door a little bit. I feel like I'm always closing that door. What, what is it about that door that just opens up magically? Um, so, you know, you might look at these and say, bird, right? I mean, that's what I say when I see all of those. I might even be tempted to say, bird, duck, uh, as a different kind of bird. But that's me being a basic level, non-expert bird categorizer. An expert bird categorizer uh, would instinctively and quickly name these things at their species level. Uh, and this happens, this kind of effective expertise happens not just in birds, but in lots of other perceptual domains. If you spend a lot of time identifying things, uh, particularly at this specific subordinate level, you get really good at it and it becomes automatic. Just like anything else in expertise, you get good at doing it at that level. Uh, experts are better at being able to remember certain facts that are relevant to their area of expertise. Uh, this comes from research uh, with chess experts. How many of you play chess at more than a recreational level that you might consider yourselves good chess players? There are a handful of you out there, right? Uh, a small handful, but there's people out there who play chess, uh, maybe just a little bit. There's some of you out there who play chess a lot. And then there's people who can become uh, professional chess players. Uh, you can earn a living. I went to graduate school uh, with uh, a student who was a graduate student, I think, in clinical psychology at the University of Buffalo. And I was a grad student there uh, who got her PhD in clinical psychology, uh, practiced as a clinical psychologist, but was also a really good chess player and eventually became a professional chess player uh, instead of a clinical psychologist because it was a better living uh, to play competitive chess. If you're really good at chess, you can make a really good living at playing chess, just like any other sport, right? Or any other activity or any other kind of competitive thing where there's prize money. Chess experts have really good chess memory. That's one of the ways in which they become good chess players because they've been playing chess for 10 years. They recognize game configurations. There's only so many configurations. There's millions of configurations, but there's only so many important configurations, ones that you've experienced when you play chess or when you study other chess games. And so it turns out that experts have really good memory. If you take a game in the middle, of, if you take a chess board in the middle of a game, Okay, right in the middle of a game the expert is playing and you wipe all the chessboard pieces away, an expert would likely be able to recreate the positions right where they left off, right? Uh, now that would be sort of a rude thing to do. Somebody's in the middle of their game, right? And then you swipe all the pieces across. A good chess player, an expert chess player, someone who is a competitive chess player should be able to get almost all the pieces back 
from memory because they were in the middle of the game. They know what they were looking at. Whereas a novice, me, for example, if I was in the middle of a chess game and somebody came and bumped the board, I would be like, oh, well, that, I guess that's over. Uh, I'm not going to recreate the game in the middle, right? There's no remembering anything. That's what, uh, and that's what we can find. So uh, there have been a number of studies in this area. And the way you can do this uh, is to take a configuration of a game midway through the game, okay? Uh, and this configuration, uh, we've got A over on the left-hand side here. Uh, a is random, and B uh, is uh, in the middle of a game, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Um, and the reason, the way you can tell that that's right, um, sorry, A is in the middle of a game, uh, B uh, is random uh, configuration. And you can tell that that's right by noting, for example, that some of the, of the two bishop pieces are on the same color. They're not going to be on the same color. It's impossible. So the configuration of pieces on the right is impossible. It's not only impossible midway through a game, it's impossible in chess, right? So this is essentially, for an expert chess player, this would be analogous to a, a bunch of letters that don't make a word. If you're good at reading in your own language, this is essentially a non-word. It's a bunch of pieces on a board that has no meaning to me, has no meaning to you, and it has no meaning to a chess expert uh, because it doesn't, it's not a game of chess, right? It's just chess pieces. This, however, is a game of chess uh, and it would be recognizable as such. And what participants would do uh, is that the better your player rating, so you're a competitive chess player, you're gonna be rated uh, as a particularly, you know, as strong or not strong, uh, depending on how many games you've won and how many uh, opponents you've beat and what quality of opponents you've beat. So as you move up the ranks of competitive chess, your player rating goes up. Uh, and if your player rating goes up and we take the chess board, wipe all the pieces uh, away uh, and ask you to reconstruct them uh, after looking at it for just 10 seconds, expert chess players, really good experts, can get most of the pieces back correctly. But not so good chess players don't do as well. So there's an effect of expertise. Uh, below 1600 player rating, you get five pieces back on, they're doing okay. 2350 and above, don't ask me what those numbers actually correspond to. I don't know enough about the world of chess to tell you how those player ratings are calculated. I'm just assuming that they're calculated in some way that is official. Uh, but I don't know how that official rating is done. Uh, but this means that they're better players. They're more expert. Um, they're able to get 20 pieces. So there's this effect of expertise, but notice the effect of expertise disappears entirely for random configurations. So when it's a random chess board, it doesn't matter what your player rating is. You can get around three, four, five pieces right. So there's no effect of expertise when the domain is nothing that you're familiar with. Does that seem clear? Let me talk about just a few more examples, then we'll try to take a little pause uh, and get through some of the work of, uh, on intelligence, which it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to finish today. So I'll probably bump some of that to, uh, to Monday because I just like talking about this stuff so much. Um, okay, so let's talk about expertise and categorization. Uh, we said that most of us, most experts, people who are really good at doing things can name these things. Uh, at the subordinate level. Let's talk about how people group things together. Remember, one of the aspects of creativity, which we kind of partially linked to people who can do things a lot, do things really well. If you get really good at doing things, you can see new solutions. One of the aspects of creativity we talked about was the ability to see uh, things at different levels, right? Uh, so whether it's those uh, convergent thinking or divergent thinking, but especially convergent thinking, the way to so you can recognize that things that don't seem similar are actually similar. That turns out to also be an important part of expertise. Um, in a well-known study, it's back in the 1980s, but this effect has been replicated in lots of domains. Even in my lab, for example, a few years ago, uh, we did a study with uh, medical experts and we looked at the difference between med students, uh, residents, and attending physicians and their ability to classify patients. And we kind of found a similar effect uh, with medical experts. But let me talk about this study uh, with physics. Uh, in this case, these are uh, people who are either experts or novice at physics problems. Now, this is not quite Erickson's definition of expertise. 
Erickson's definition of expertise, you gotta be consistently superior, you work in 10,000 hours. This is a more moderate level of expertise. These are physics PhD students, which I think you could agree are people who've been thinking about physics for at least eight years, right? They've excelled at physics as an undergrad. They probably did well at physics uh, as um, in high school or secondary school. And now they're in grad school, they're getting a PhD in physics at least as it comes down to solving basic physics problems, they're pretty good, right? Relative to their undergraduate peers. How many of you have taken one physics class in university, uh, sort of a first year physics class? How many of you have decided to go on to do a PhD in physics based on your performance in that one physics class? Hands are not going up. Physics is kind of hard, right? I mean, lots of things are hard, but physics can be challenging for a lot of us because there are a lot of different principles to remember, right? Uh, there are a lot of different laws of physics, laws of motion, laws of friction, laws of uh, Newtonian physics, uh, quantum physics, and so on. So this is really basic stuff. We're going to take physics PhD students who've been solving and TAing uh, and teaching basic physics principles for years, and we're going to compare them to the average undergrad, which are you know maybe uh, people like you or your peers who took a first year physics class and promptly said, this is not for me. Um, and we ask them to sort them into categories based on how they should be solved. Uh, this should be pretty straightforward. Um, and here's what they found. So here are some examples. Uh, so for example, here is problem 10. These numbers correspond to the problem number in a standard university undergraduate physics problem. So uh, don't worry about the number. Uh, just worry about the diagram. Um, here is one problem, problem 10, grouped with problem 11. And you can see why anybody would put these together, right? These kind of look the same. Uh, here's a disc with some arrows. Here's another disc. And the novice says, um, angular velocity and momentum, circular things. Uh, another novice says, I put these together because rotational kinematics, angular speeds, angular velocities, problems that have something rotating. So that's not wrong, right? That's a perfectly good way to categorize and classify those patients or those um, uh, those problems. They are things that have to do with angular velocity uh, and rotation. Here's another one, problem seven and problem se 723 and 735. Blocks on an inclined plane. Friction, blocks on inclined planes with angles. That is a very good description of exactly what this problem looks like. Block, inclined plane, angle, right? You can see why the novice puts these together. However, what I want you to pay attention to is what the expert has done. Uh, the expert has classified this same problem with an entirely different looking problem. Uh, and that's because the expert recognizes the basic physics principle that's needed to solve that problem. In other words, they ignore the surface feature and they pay attention to what uh, we can describe as a deeper feature. Just like our expert birders name things at a subordinate level, our expert physics problem solvers sort things based on how they ought to be solved not based on how they look. They can look past this and say that these things get grouped together because conservation of energy, work energy theorem, they are all straightforward problems. These can be done from energy considerations. Either you should know the principle of conservation of energy or work is lost somewhere. So this problem, which has a spring and a block and some stuff, and this problem, which has blocks on an inclined plane, are relying on the same basic uh, work energy theorem uh, to solve the problem. They look different on the surface, but they have an underlying structure uh, that draws them together for the expert. In other research in this uh, paper, that's what the experts were focused on, the solution relevant deep structure of these problems rather than the surface structure. The, ex the novice can be forgiven, uh, because they don't know, they obviously aren't physics experts. They don't always know how these principles should be applied. Maybe they don't remember uh, the principles. And so what they see is how the problem looks. Uh, they may not remember exactly which principle uh, is needed to solve it. And that's why, of course, if you've taken an undergraduate class in physics and you struggle during an exam, it might be because uh, you don't remember the principle of physics uh, that lets you solve these. In fact, maybe you get distracted by the way the problem actually looks. Okay, so I'm gonna do a summary of expertise. Then let's take a 10 minute break, not a 10 minute break, we'll never finish. Let's take a three minute breather uh, just to sort of catch our breath. And then we'll try to get through as much of the intelligence 
uh, content as I'd like to. Remember, I did build in some extra time, so we'll, we will not go past uh, Monday's class. We'll just get through Monday, and that's it. We're not going to have uh, new content past that. Expertise is complex. Experts can process information more effectively and in different ways than novices. Let's take a few minutes to catch our breath and talk about intelligence, which is another way to solve problems and to be an expert.
Okay, everyone, what do you say we try to um, get through as much of this as we can uh, between now and 420? Uh, so that's, uh, what is that, about 35, uh, 40 minutes. So let's try to get through as much as we can, and then we'll just find a convenient uh, stopping point, uh, and we'll pick up on Monday. Does that sound reasonable? Oh, and remember, there's a quiz on Monday. Uh, that quiz will happen right at the end of class at 5 o'clock. Uh, at which point they will then we'll, I'll remind everybody that there's also the makeup quiz on uh, Wednesday, uh, and then we'll be getting ready for the final exam. So I'll have more to say about it at the end of class, uh, a little bit more to say about it on uh, Monday. Yes. I think I just have questions from everything. Uh, so the makeup quiz will just be a, se a selection of questions that occurred on some of the other quizzes, basically, uh, or similar to ones that appeared on the other quizzes. Uh, so there won't be any new types of questions on there. Does that make sense? Okay. It's a chance to do better. Yes. Correct. Uh, so the idea that I will drop the lowest quiz would only really play, would only really come into effect if you do that fifth quiz. If you don't do the fifth quiz, then I could just score that as a zero and then simply drop that. Uh, so when I say I will drop the lowest quiz, I mean I will drop the lowest quiz of five. Your grade for the quizzes includes the four highest quizzes that you've done. If you've only done four, then those four are the four highest. If you've done five, then it will be the four highest of those five. Does that make sense to everyone? So there's no cost to doing the makeup quiz. Uh, absolutely none. You cannot make your mark any worse by doing the makeup quiz. Uh, you can only improve uh, is the only direction. So you either don't change or you can improve. Does that seem clear to everybody? So in other words, take the makeup quiz. Uh, what do you got to lose? Nothing except for maybe 20 minutes out of your day. What is intelligence? Uh, so let's, uh, this actually is a really good segue because we talked about creativity and insight which requires a certain kind of disposition in some cases, right? Uh, we then talked about expertise, which also requires some personality characteristics. So in order to be an expert chess player, you gotta like chess and you gotta have the time to spend playing chess. And maybe you need to have a personality disposition that, in, that you get enjoyment out of practicing the violin or playing chess uh, for several hours a day for uh, any number of years, right? Uh, those kinds of things seem to be innate, or they seem to be part of your temperament or your personality, or something that might have some genetic uh, aspects to it. And that's why intelligence makes sense to include here, because intelligence also uh, has some contributions from uh, your genetic makeup. Uh, not entirely, uh, lots of aspects of measured intelligence are things that are also uh, determined by your environment. And we'll talk about it, that at the very end uh, or on Monday when we come to it. So let's talk about what intelligence is. Uh, most of what we call intelligence uh, can be described as intellectual ability. Uh, it can be described uh, as uh, intellectual or cognitive performance. Sometimes we think of it as academic performance or problem solving ability. Um, it can be measured by something called an intelligence quotient or IQ, which we're all familiar with the term, right? IQ is something you're familiar with. Uh, at some point early in its development, the idea of an IQ uh, was the ratio between someone's mental age as measured by a test uh, and their chronological age. Ideally, it should be the same, right? So how you're measured in terms of your intellectual development should be equivalent to where you are chronologically you know less as a kid uh, than you do as an adult, right? We know reasons why that should be the case. Uh, younger children have uh, reduced executive functioning. Uh, they have less uh, knowledge in general. They have less semantic memory, uh, less semantic knowledge, uh, shorter attention spans, lots of things why younger kids uh, should have intellectual abilities that are different from adults. Uh, so we look at that ratio. Uh, if your intellectual ability tracks with where your chronological age is, then you should have an average IQ. But most intelligence uh, tests uh, rely on subsets uh, of these things. And they're scaled so that the average, and you probably all know this, the average IQ 
uh, for a cohort should be standardized to be 100. So that's the average, uh, meaning that most people uh, should have an IQ around 100, regardless of the cohort. Uh, so these things can be renormed because questions that might have seemed difficult or easy in a previous generation might not be difficult or easy in a current generation. Uh, there might be more exposure to certain things. So IQ tests are kind of updated uh, and they're updated so that the average uh, is uh, 100. And these things can be measured by asking, uh, presenting a series of words of increasing difficulty. A Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, which is sort of the modern version of the uh, original IQ test uh, is one that's administered by professional test administrators. It's not an online test, though there are uh, quick and easy correlates. There are lots of faster, easier ways to test your intellectual ability. But the Wechsler test is one that's administered uh, by a professional uh, and interpreted by a professional. And so the tests would be, uh, for example, presenting a series of words of increasing difficulty. Uh, what's a lute? What does solitude mean? Comprehension. Explain why certain social practices are followed or the meaning of Proverbs. What does it mean to say, don't judge a book by its cover? Uh, or to look at similarities in what ways are an airplane and a car alike? Um, or information, uh, knowing uh, basic uh, semantic uh, information in your culture. So lots of different things can measure vocabulary, verbal intelligence, similarities. Uh, you can also look at uh, visual spatial intelligence. In this case, the test taker would be asked to come up with which pieces and in which order uh, do these, uh, can you recreate this flag? So would you choose one, three, and I think it might be four rotated. Uh, so there are three pieces that you can put together to make this. And these can be made uh, in increasing uh, difficulty. Uh, the more of these you can solve, the higher your visual spatial intelligence. Um, another one, which also is visual spatial, uh, but also relies on some working memory, uh, is Raven's progressive matrices. And I've seen this in quite a lot in uh, research settings. Raven's progressive matrices um, is a problem solving uh, measure. Your, the idea here is that you solve a problem that doesn't require verbal ability. So this is not a test of vocabulary. This is not a test of facts. Uh, this is a test of nonverbal problem solving. Your job is to pick which one of these tiles completes the sequence. This is a pretty easy one. If you have a white square, a white diamond, a square with a cross, the next one would be the number two, right? The diamond with a cross. That's... Uh, a likely uh, uh, addition to that. Uh, so it's several things go into this. And these also uh, have increasing difficulty. The more you can solve, the higher uh, your uh, visual, spatial, uh, and nonverbal reasoning. Most IQ tests uh, are pretty accurate in terms of their reliability and their validity. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they're testing uh, everything that goes into a person's intelligence or their intellectual capacity. What it means is that uh, when you test someone and test them again at a later time, they're likely to score at the same level. There's a high test retest uh, reliability. So the consistency of a measure, if you've been given an official standardized Wechsler adult intelligence scale as an adolescent, and then later uh, as an older adult, you're likely gonna score at roughly the same level. Even if the test items are different and the test has changed, uh, you should be scoring at roughly the same level. There's a very high test, retest reliability for intelligence tests. Uh, there's also a pretty good validity. In other words, most intelligence tests do a really good job of testing uh, the kinds of things that we assume are intellectual. Uh, in other words, things that predict academic performance, things that predict uh, scholarly performance, things that predict certain kinds of aptitudes. So uh, your grade point average, uh, for example, uh, is fairly highly correlated with your IQ, which makes sense, 
right? The kinds of things that are required for good performance in a school setting are also the kinds of things that seem to be measured on IQ tests. Yes. Yes and no. So the question was, if somebody's really has had some practice in taking IQ tests, will that affect the test retest reliability or the validity of the test? In other words, can you get better at taking IQ tests? There is some evidence that not only do people get better at taking IQ tests if they take a lot of them, uh, but that entire cohorts get better. Um, if I have time to it, we'll come to this so-called Flynn effect, which is the idea that worldwide intelligence seems to be increasing at rates that cannot be explained by a purely biological model of intelligence. In other words, if the test is as accurate at measuring what it's supposed to measure, the entire world can't just be getting smarter, right? Uh, it, you can't have a normed test of intellectual ability, which is supposed to be rooted uh, in a biological measure of intelligence. Uh, and note that over the last 100 years, scores continue to do increase across many different countries uh, and in lots of different cultures. And yet that seems to be happening. Uh, over the last 50, uh, 60 years, IQ has increased. Yes, and that's why originally these things weren't noticed uh, because as tests are renormed, uh, new groups of uh, people who take them uh, are then scaled so that they're uh, normed to have an average of 100. Uh, but if you look at whether or not uh, certain items can be solved, you can look at whether or not those things uh, have increased over time. So yes, in order to standardize them, they can be brought to zero. Uh, but unstandardized, they seem to be rising uh, across different cultures. I'll come to that at the very end of today's lecture. Um, there's also a distinction that we make in the literature between generalized and specialized intelligence. This is one that probably makes sense to a lot of us. Uh, generalized intelligence, which some people just call G, uh, is an overall uh, mental capacity. Uh, if you have a high IQ, uh, you should likely do well at any kind of task that requires mental activity, whether it's solving problems, uh, doing mathematics, uh, reading comprehension. Uh, you should be good at most of those things or all of those things. If you have a lower below average general intelligence, then you will struggle to do most of those things. Uh, and so this is the idea of a general intelligence. In other words, all the different measures of intelligence correlate with each other. And because they all correlate with each other, they may all be tapping into a single factor. Um, and so using factor analysis, confirmatory uh, factor analysis, uh, suggests that general intelligence factor is shared by most intelligence uh, subsets. Now, whether or not this is determined biologically or environmentally or some combination is a different argument. Uh, the suggestion is that with general intelligence, it's general intellectual capacity. This can correlate with your academic ability, with your mathematical ability, your visual spatial reasoning ability, uh, and your verbal ability. Is this fact analysis here that similar to Yeah, yeah. So what we, we can do is we can use lots of different tests and we can determine what are the key factors. In personality theory, it might be five personality traits or six personality traits that seem to reliably uh, predict what people's performance would be. And with factor analysis, it suggests that although those things might correlate, they seem to be independent traits. Uh, with most intelligence testing, the suggestion is that uh, there is the possibility. Uh, it's possible to come up with a general factor that correlates with all of the different subsets. However, uh, there are specialized intelligence because most people can be measured to be a little better on some of these things. In other words, more like the traits that you've suggested. Uh, personality, intelligence uh, scales do correlate so much so that there seems to be a general intelligence or a general intellectual ability, uh, but they don't correlate perfectly. Uh, there are cases where a single number can be a crude summary of intellectual skill sets. In other words, you could be good at numeric cognition. Uh, you may be really good at uh, numeric reasoning, or you might be really good at verbal reasoning. And that's why when you take entrance exams, whether it's for the MCAT, uh, the SAT, or the GRE, or any of these ent standardized entrance exams, there's usually a test for quantitative ability, 
There's a test for verbal ability. There's a test for uh, general knowledge. There's a test for spatial ability. So those things correlate. They can be influenced by general intelligence, but there's also some specialized ability, which gives rise to what we might consider uh, a hierarchical model of intelligence, where individuals can be said to have high general intelligence, average general intelligence, or below average general intelligence. And that comes from uh, things like linguistic ability, numeric ability, and spatial ability. So those three factors uh, seem to be the most distinct. It probably is no surprise, and it probably uh, you probably noticed that these things map on somewhat to the working memory model that we've talked about, suggesting that we have verbal processing. We have a phonological loop and verbal working memory. Uh, and people differ in their uh, quantitative uh, abilities. Uh, some of that also depends on verbal working memory. Uh, and we also have spatial uh, working memory and spatial ability and spatial intelligence, which influences general intelligence, but seems to be distinct from this verbal ability. So this hierarchical model, which may assume that we have lots of specialized ability, like I'm really good uh, at you know, navigating through new cities, but I'm not really good uh, at remembering what I read, right? So there might be some specialized abilities, uh, which then give rise to these factors, which then give rise to this general intelligence, which seems to be uh, predictive across the board. Does that seem clear to everyone? Um, and so we see moderately strong correlations among uh, all of these IQ subsets. In other words, they're correlated with each other, uh, but within the same category, any tests of numeric ability are gonna be more strongly correlated with other tests of numeric ability. And that's some of the uh, strongest evidence for this hierarchical model. So yes, things are correlated, uh, each of these abilities is correlated with the other abilities, but within these abilities, you see even higher correlations. Another distinction that's often made, and this is one that's particularly relevant as individuals age, uh, is the difference between fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence, uh, because these things seem to develop at different rates. Uh, fluid intelligence is what is often measured in most of those uh, adult intelligence scales. So when we show the Raven's progressive matrices, great test of fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is your reasoning ability. It's your ability to think uh, creatively. Uh, it's to deal with novel problems. So fluid intelligence is what you want if you are trying to do something new. If you're uh, hiring an engineer, you want somebody who's high in fluid intelligence. If you're hiring somebody to be a, a screenwriter, you want somebody who's high in fluid intelligence. If you're hiring somebody uh, to be a showrunner for your Netflix series, you really want somebody who's high in fluid intelligence. Lots of problems to solve and lots of abilities to solve those problems, right? Uh, that's high fluid intelligence. It does seem to peak in early adulthood. You all are high in fluid intelligence relative to me. Uh, your fluid intelligence is right about at its peak. Uh, those of you that are in university, uh, halfway through university, getting ready to go to graduate school, peak fluid intelligence, right? You're the type of people as young students who are about to go out and change the world, right? That's the whole point of being in university. Uh, you've got the good ideas. Uh, you're amassing some knowledge so that you can go out and take those good ideas and make something new from them. I have no good ideas, right? I am the opposite. I am in the crystallized intelligence uh, phase. So I am in the phase where my fluid intelligence abilities start to decrease. It doesn't mean that I'm not smart anymore. It just means that I'm not 24 anymore, right? I don't, I'm not as quick on my feet. Uh, however, what I have that most uh, university students and graduate students would have less of uh, is crystallized intelligence. In other words, I've been doing this for 20 years or 30 years. I know more things. I'm not as quick, but I know a lot. Uh, and that seems to be the trade-off between fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Uh, drastic. Um, it does seem to be. Uh, great question, because I had a slide for this. Uh, uh, it does seem to be that normalized scores 
suggests that around 20 is your peak and then it just declines. There is no escaping this. Uh, tests of speeded performance, reasoning ability and memory declines. There is no way to escape this. Your fluid intelligence basically from here on in is on the way down. Now you won't notice it. You won't notice it for a while until you get to be middle-aged. You won't notice it for a while until you get to be past middle-aged. However, as your chronological age increases, and I am right about here, uh, 53, just about 54, I'm right about ready to peak in my crystallized intelligence. So I'm about at the point where I know a lot of things, uh, which kind of makes sense for the dynamic in university, right? Your professors are older, they know things, uh, and you are acquiring those things and learning to move with them, especially if you're going on to graduate school uh, or you're going on into the workforce and you're taking what you've learned and making something new with it. So that's this trade-off. And many people, uh, for example, in my case, might refer to this as an area of second strength. As I recognize that my fluid intelligence is decreasing, I might look to apply my expertise in ways that don't depend on fluid intelligence. In other words, I don't want to depend on coming up with new ideas. I might want to uh, apply my strengths to uh, seeing what ideas are out there and assessing them relative to maybe a big picture. Uh, and that's maybe what managers do uh, or directors do uh, or supervisors do uh, or lab uh, directors and so on might do those kinds of things. That's what university administrators might do is look at the big picture uh, beyond several cohorts. So fluid intelligence, it does decline. Uh, you're all right at your peak and you're gonna sort of be at this peak for a while, but as uh, you start to age, it will decline. Yes. Yeah, so exactly, it's a great point. So does this have anything to do with the fact that our brains uh, fully develop uh, in our sort of mid twenties? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, as your brain fully develops, that's when you reach your peak of fluid intelligence. Your reasoning abilities are at their best. Your problem-solving abilities are at their best. Uh, your creativity is at your best. And you can ride out this coast here for a little bit, but eventually you're gonna see the trade-off. Uh, and around about middle age, for most of us, uh, our fluid intelligence has declined enough that we can't count on it, but our crystallized intelligence has risen enough that we can count on it to make up uh, for our slowed performance. Okay, we may actually get to the end of today's lecture. Um, there's a good chance uh, because some of the slides are going to go by really quick. I sure hope we do. Um, let's talk about some of the roots. Uh, intelligence is influenced by both genetics and experience. Uh, this is not controversial to most of us. Uh, there's lots of correlation with genetic ability. Uh, lots of twin studies have shown, uh, and I'll show you those uh, slides in just a bit. Uh, that there's a strong genetic component to intellectual ability in the same way that there's a strong genetic component uh, to, your, to your height, uh, a strong genetic component to your weight and your general size. Lots of things determine uh, aspects of your person. And like any of those things, there's also a strong environmental uh, component. Just like your height might be genetically determined if you have tall parents, you also need to be properly nourished in order to reach uh, your full height. Uh, generations have gotten taller. Uh, that's no surprise. I once was average height. I am no longer <laughs> average height. People are taller than me now. Um, and people two generations earlier, have you ever been uh, to a, a historic museum uh, that might have had uh, uniforms, let's say, from pe people wore uniforms or clothing from the 19, early 1900s or 1800s, and it looked like everybody was tiny back then right? Everyone was like this tall and everybody weighed about, uh, you know, half of what I weighed. That's because it wasn't as good of nutrition uh, in those days. And so people were uh, shorter in the 1800s. And you see this in intellectual development as well. Um, so uh, most of this kind of biological uh, evidence for intelligence comes from twin studies. Uh, it's one of the only ways to control for genetics and environment. So if you compare for example, monozygotic twins reared together. These are identical twins uh, and they're raised in the same uh, setting. So same parents, uh, they're gonna have very strong correlations of intellectual ability. You measure their IQs, their IQs are gonna be about the same. And that's because they share both things, right? They share almost identical genes uh, because they're monozygotic uh, twins 
uh, and they share uh, sort of the same um, uh, the same settings. And if you take monozygotic twins who are reared apart, in other words, and this is a very small subset, but these this is a group of individuals that exists, right? These are people who are biologically identical twins who were adopted into different families. So genetically, they are the same, but they have different backgrounds and different environments. Now, there's some caveats to that, but uh, they've been raised in different uh, settings with different parents, different adoptive parents. They are str strongly and highly correlated in their intellectual ability, suggesting that uh, whatever contributes to IQ is connected to their genetic ability. They got different parents. They've got different settings. Now, it might be that the people who adopted them uh, found something in them that uh, meant that they were getting adopted into similar kinds of families. Uh, so that also remains a possibility. Nonetheless, these are identical twins, different families. These are non-identical twins. These are uh, fraternal twins uh, or uh, twins that don't share genetic uh, ability uh, in a way that's different, that's similar, but not quite like uh, siblings. If they're raised in the same household, their correlation is lower than their identical twin counterparts who were raised in different families. Uh, so something about being the same genetic material uh, gives people this uh, correlation advantage. Siblings reared together, myself uh, and one or, one or two of my brothers, uh, we don't correlate as highly uh, as monozygotic twins uh, in different families. Unrelated individuals in different households, not surprisingly, have no reason to correlate. Uh, there isn't any particular reason why two randomly selected people should have any correlation. Uh, there isn't, right? They should have average IQs, but if you pick one who's higher, it doesn't mean that someone else should be higher. That should be a zero correlation, uh, and it is. So this is evidence for this genetic uh, component of intelligence. However, um, it's been known for a long time uh, that certain conditions, poverty, for example, or poor nutrition also affect IQ. Uh, in order for individuals to reach their full potential, just like you would see for height uh, or any kind of physical characteristic, you still need to see that uh, for intellectual. So the longer a child remains in an environment that is uh, less than ideal, the longer that effect should be. For example, uh, if individuals, now this is again a very small subset of individuals, so uh, take that uh, with a bit of a caveat, IQ scores of children who were adopted out of environments in which they had been abused or neglected. So these might be children who are in an unsafe setting, a neglected setting. Individuals who are neglected are going to not have the kind of environment that would be conducive to good intellectual development. Yes, there's still going to be the biological component, but maybe they're not receiving uh, all that's necessary to reach their full potential. So these are people who would be adopted out of those settings. Uh, and also suggesting that they might be adopted into uh, families that are in a higher socioeconomic status. In other words, families who likely have more resources, more time, better uh, conditions, more uh, financial resources and more time resources, and probably live in places with better school boards, uh, probably live in places with more access uh, to food uh, and childcare. So those high SES versus low SES uh, families. And what you can see is pre-adoption and post-adoption uh, for those who were adopted into the higher SES settings, uh, the improvement uh, is higher. So something about being taken out of a deficient environment and being placed in an environment that allows for more of those things uh, to grow uh, helps uh, individuals reach a better potential. So let me just finish by talking about the Flynn effect and we will complete this lecture on time, which is impressive because I didn't have any idea that we were gonna get there. Um, the Flynn effect, which I mentioned before, is that scores on intelligence tests have risen approximately three points per decade over the last few decades. Set aside the fact that you want to renorm them, uh, unnormed scores would rise about three points. Uh, now, humans do change genetically, but not over a decade, right? Uh, so this suggests uh, that there's a very, it's very difficult, uh, especially for fluid uh, intelligence. Uh, it's observed in nations 
uh, who might be described as affluent, in other words, countries with a lot of resources, a high uh, economic status, uh, lots of gross domestic product, high standard of living, uh, and developing uh, countries also see the same change. Over the last few decades, IQ test scores have risen worldwide, which uh, Flynn, uh, James Flynn, which I'll show you in just a minute, argues cannot be explained by genetics. There's something that suggests that people are getting better. They're getting better at either taking tests. Uh, society has made it more likely that these tests are measuring something that society has, uh, you know, as, as the society becomes better, more standard educated, standardly educated, uh, perhaps maybe uh, the skills that are needed for an IQ test uh, are being trained, which means that if you can train people to get better at IQ tests, it's not just purely biological. <clears throat> so what Flynn found, and I won't go through all of this, uh, is that uh, when he originally looked at 14 different countries, uh, suggests uh, that the hypothesis that best fits the result that IQ tests do not measure intelligence, rather correlate with a weak causal link to intelligence. Uh, in other words, they're related to intelligence, but they don't measure intelligence. What they're measuring is something uh, that's maybe academic performance. Um, starts with some Norwegian uh, data, but also looks at lots of other countries. Here's the Netherlands showing that from 1952 to the 1980s, uh, the percentage change in IQ of 100 becomes 106, 112, and 121, uh, sort of uncorrected. So in other words, uh, Dutch people uh, over the 1950s to the 1980s, uh, their average IQ rose significantly. Uh, you can see this uh, in Canada for young children in Edmonton and Saskatchewan, uh, whether it's uh, various different uh, types of tests, IQ gains uh, on individual points. You can see this in the United States from 1932 to 1978, looking at different kinds of uh, tests showing this same kind of increase uh, happening uh, with cohorts. And so this continued uh, through the 1980s and in through the 1990s, but the most recent picture suggests that maybe uh, the Flynn effect has stopped. Uh, in other words, perhaps maybe the increase had something to do with modernization. The increase had something to do with uh, access to standardized nutrition across the world, but it had access to uh, standard, more standardized academic uh, curricula across the world which then suggests that perhaps maybe uh, IQ is still a relatively good measure of intelligence. It's just that not everybody was uh, behaving in a way or able to act in a way that let them reach uh, an average intelligence in the early part of the 20th century. But by the end of the 20th century, uh, across many different countries, the things that would enable uh, that biologically determined intelligence to reach its potential uh, seems to have uh, leveled off. So, there have been several studies that have looked at this, by the way, this either what they call a pl plateau of the Flynn effect, or in some cases, a reverse Flynn effect, where you might see over a cohort, uh, intellectual ability uh, seems to decrease for a little while, which might suggest an overall uh, leveling out. So this looked at Norwegian uh, army uh, recruits uh, and found that from 1954 to 2002, you can see that the average intelligence kind of got up to around 112 here. Uh, and in the 90s, it sort of leveled out. So there's strong increases predicted by the Flynn effect uh, in the middle of the 20th century. By the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, uh, there seems to be a leveling out of IQ scores, suggesting that if we renorm these to be 100, uh, it should be fairly stable. It seems to have been fairly stable uh, for the last uh, decade or so. So this decade jump uh, seems to change. Uh, and what they also found uh, was that the bulk of what seemed to be a Flynn effect, so when there are changes, it seems to be uh, happening most uh, with this visual spatial reasoning. It doesn't seem to happen as much uh, with uh, math and quantitative ability. In fact, there's very little change over time with mathematical ability. And there's some change with time and leveling out uh, with verbal intelligence, but there seems to be a little bit more uh, with this reasoning intelligence, some possibility that maybe people have just gotten a little better uh, at doing those kinds of tests because of the kinds of problems that maybe modern people 
uh, have found themselves uh, looking at. Uh, evidence for the biological uh, and nutrition aspect suggests that the height of the average Norwegian army recruit tracks very well with general intelligence over the decades. So people in Norway got taller at roughly the same rate that they got smarter, uh, suggesting that there really might be something to this nutritional aspect uh, to the Flynn effect. Okay, so summary for today, we finished off right on time. Uh, general intellectual ability can be measured. We can measure general intelligence. We can measure specialized intelligence. Uh, it may not be and probably isn't everything uh, that has to do with intelligence, but it's one aspect of mental and intellectual ability. These tests have strong reliability and strong valid validity, but general scores have risen over the 20th century and seem to have leveled out, reflecting possibly better nutrition worldwide uh, and also modern education and literacy worldwide. 415, how's that? Uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Remember, and I'll try to remind everyone uh, on OWL, the quiz will be on Monday. Monday will be our final content lecture with new information. Uh, then we'll review things on Wednesday and that will be it for the term.